But Jackson's respite at the Hermitage was short-lived. Tensions between Indians and white settlers were still running high. Jackson led his army throughout the southeast, taking control of more Indian land by treaty or bloodshed. In 1817, Jackson was ordered by President James Monroe to stop the Seminole Indians who occupied Spanish-controlled Florida from crossing into U.S. territory. The ever-ambitious Jackson, however, saw a perfect opportunity to do far more. Why not take control of all of Florida and make it part of the United States? He bypasses the Secretary of War and goes right to the president, to the main man, and says, just give me the word and I can take Florida. Now that's an act of war and only Congress can declare war. Well, in those days, but the president is the commander in chief of the army. And Jackson is convinced, and so am I, that Monroe does give him that authority. Jackson found himself skirmishing with Seminole Indians and Spaniards in Florida, but he knew his real enemy was still the British, hoping to keep American borders from expanding. When Jackson distrusted the British, he had every reason for doing so. The British actually had been behind the Indian uprising. The British were encouraging the Spanish to mischief in Florida. The British recognized that the United States was a long-term threat to Britain's power in North America and in the Atlantic. And they were, they were doing everything they could to contain that power, to keep it bottled up. Again, troops under Jackson's command emerged victorious. When Spain officially gave up Florida, Jackson resigned from the army, accepting an appointment as governor to organize the new territorial government. Rachel joined him in Pensacola. There's perception of her that she was perhaps demure and didn't want to involve herself in political affairs. But what we see in Pensacola is her taking a very active role in advising Jackson on how he feels he should govern that city. Jackson needed only 11 weeks to set up Florida's new government. Shortly after returning home, he suffered a physical breakdown. At age 55, the years of fighting duels, Indians, and the British had taken their toll. For several months, violent coughing spells and severe dysentery made life miserable. Though retirement seemed inevitable, Jackson became obsessed about rampant corruption in Washington and his sense of moral outrage pushed him to consider running for president. What really got Jackson's attention, what really convinced him that he had to put his hat in the ring was when people said, you are a soldier. You have said that you support the interests of the American people. Well, if you're serious about this and if the American people call you to office, you have no choice but to answer the call. So Jackson allowed his name to be put into nomination for the presidency in 1824. 1824 was a watershed election in the United States. For the first time, a substantial number of commoners could vote for president. The Constitution simply says that the states shall choose electors. It didn't say how the state shall choose electors. And in most states, until the 1820s, the electors were chosen by the state legislatures. But during 1810s and 1820s, increasingly, Ordinary voters get to cast their ballots for president, technically for the electors, but in effect, for president. Jackson, the hero of New Orleans, appealed to voters across the nation and easily won the popular vote with a count of 153,000. John Quincy Adams, whose support came primarily from the Northeast, received 108,000 votes. Treasury Secretary William Crawford and House Speaker Henry Clay narrowly split another 90,000 votes. Jackson also received the most electoral votes, 99. But he needed a true majority, 131, to become president. As provided by the Constitution, members of the House of Representatives had to choose among the three front runners, Jackson, Adams, and Crawford. The fourth place finisher, Henry Clay, having received 37 electoral votes, was in a powerful position to sway the election. Clay was the hero of the West. He's from Kentucky until Jackson comes along. 
Jackson's from Tennessee. And Jackson is the greater hero, being the military hero. So Clay swings his support to John Quincy Adams, who carries the day, wins the presidency, becomes president, and turns around and names Henry Clay to be Secretary of State. Now, in our day and age, this might not seem like a big deal, but in those days, it was everything. Because a succession of presidents before John Quincy Adams had gone from Secretary of State to President. So in naming Henry Clay to be Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams essentially made him heir apparent to the presidency. Jackson was furious. He publicly damned Clay for what he called a corrupt bargain. He called him Judas of the West. Judas has received his 30 pieces of silver, and he will have the same ending. Jackson and his supporters, they declared that the election had been stolen, the will of the people had been frustrated, and immediately in the spring of 1825, they began the campaign of 1828. We often think today that elections last a long time. Not at all. They don't have anything on the campaigns of the 1820s. While Jackson remained in Tennessee over the next three years, his surrogates worked tirelessly throughout the country to secure the Democratic Party nomination. Although not officially defined as such, the election of 1828 produced the first choice between a Republican, John Quincy Adams, supported by established power brokers, and Jackson, the Democrat, who championed the cause of the common man. The election campaign of 1820 was probably the dirtiest campaign in American political history. Everything that Jackson had done wrong, or that anybody thought had done wrong, was dragged out and used against him. They said some terrible things about his mother, Jackson's mother. They said she was a prostitute who was brought to this country to service British soldiers. And of uh, Rachel Jackson, that she was a bigamist, and by implication, if not otherwise, a whore. Rachel never states that she's aware that she's become a liability for her husband. I think she was always confident in his love for her, even if perhaps she may have sensed that some of those around him might have seen her as baggage. The three years of organized campaigning by Jackson's supporters paid off. In November 1828, Jackson won both the popular vote and the electoral majority, becoming the seventh president of the United States. But his joy was short-lived, as Rachel had a heart attack one month later. General Jackson! General Jackson! What is it? On December 22nd, Rachel Donaldson Robards Jackson died. Rachel. At the moment of his greatest political victory, he suffers the most severe personal blow he could imagine. God. Rachel had been his lifelong companion, had been the love of his life, and now she's taken from him. On the day that they had originally scheduled to go to Washington, Rachel was buried instead, and Jackson chose to bury her in the garden at the Hermitage, which she had loved so much. Jackson was absolutely convinced that she was murdered by those people who had said these things about her. And on her tombstone, he had written that here lies, you know, a, a sainted being who was viciously attacked, but whose virtue could surpass it all. The death of his beloved wife sent President-elect Andrew Jackson plunging from triumph to despair. He couldn't imagine leaving the Hermitage and moving into the White House without Rachel as his First Lady. He almost decided not to go to Washington. He believed that his emotional life, in a certain sense, was over. And for months after, he was in a very deep depression. He, he wrote, the one thing that made him decide that he had to go was, first of all, the people had chosen him. And Jackson had an absolute reverence for the will of the people. But there was also something personal, and that was, my enemies have killed Rachel. They will pay. So off he goes to be inaugurated president. 